Uh, looking forward to having a conversation uh, about what we do. Uh, my name is Jason Taylor. I'm the Executive Director of Grow Land Trust. I have lived in Iowa my whole life. I was born in Southeast Iowa, rural, rural Southeast Iowa, um, a couple miles from Missouri. I moved up to Iowa City in 97 to go to school. And I've pretty much been here my whole life, um, or since then. Uh, I've been at Berwick Land Trust since uh, 2018. I first started as a land steward there. And then a year later, in 2019, I became the executive director. And I consider myself incredibly fortunate to be working with this organization in this community. I really do love Iowa City, Johnson County. Um, I think we're very fortunate to have the, the, the community that we do have in this area. So for those of you that aren't aware, uh, land trusts, there's six different land trusts in the state of Iowa. And we are, um, we're again, very community supported. All, every single one of us is community supported. The idea of a land trust is that there are uh, land, there's land that needs to be protected within any given state. And so there are hundreds of land trusts across the entire country. In Iowa, with these six, we protect about 176,000 acres total between all these organizations. Uh, you may recognize some of them. The, the you know, world's largest uh, land trust, Nation Conservancy, they have millions of acres spread across numerous countries around the world. Um, and then there's some that just have one particular property that they, that they manage. Uh, what we do is, it's a little bit different. Um, we've been around since 1978, so we're a fairly established organization. We were actually started by uh, an individual named Nancy Cyberlin, and she really thought that uh, there needed to be a way for land to be protected in Johnson County. And so she got together with a, a group of individuals, and they established Borough Land Trust. At the time, it was called Johnson County Heritage Trust. Um, but then we changed the name in 2013 because really we wanted to expand beyond Johnson County in the scope of the work that we did. Currently, our organization is protecting about 1,000 acres, um, and that's a, that's a pretty decent number for the staff of an organization of our size. We operate in 15 different counties within the state of Iowa, all in eastern Iowa. We don't own property in each of those counties, but we do a lot of land management. There's a lot of work that needs to be done on native properties in the state, and we think that our organization is really posed to help provide landowners with the ability to do some of that work, like prescribed fire, things that some landowners aren't able to do. What we do as a land trust is we focus on a number of things. Uh, we focus on land preservation, making sure that land isn't all developed or turned into agriculture. We do a lot of habitat management. Many of you probably know, if you just let land sit in the state of Iowa, it doesn't just turn into a, a perfect preserve, it turns into a lot of invasive species. And so you get some really gnarly stuff like multiflora rose, uh, honeysuckle, tree of heaven, all of these things start growing up very quickly. And so land management is an absolutely critical piece of the, the work that we do to, to maintain habitat in the state. We also try to get the community involved. Um, when I grew up, I lived in the country. And every single day after school, an entire summer, I was outside. I was walking through creeks. I was you know, looking for frogs in ponds. That's just a life that I had as I was, I was in the country. I was exposed to nature every single day. Unfortunately, we're starting to drift away from that pretty far. And so what we want to do is not only involve kids in nature, but get adults back into nature as well. And so we provide a lot of opportunities for parents to bring their kids out, but also for adults just to go out and, and find the solitude that nature can provide. We also provide a lot of educational programs uh, for the community as well. We are a 501c3, so we are a nonprofit. Um, we are community supported, but we also get funding from both the federal and uh, the state, and as well as private grants as well. This is just some of the work that we're doing, and I'll talk about some of the projects that we have going on. But first, I'm going to talk about a little bit about um, some of the actual projects that we work on. So the two big focuses of the program that we have, this is semi-working, so my apologies. There we go. Um, we focus on habitat restoration, so making sure that the native habitat that we have is uh, in a good state so that the species can live there, and also trying to provide educational opportunities for individuals to learn about what should be on those programs. Um, we do a lot of sharing of the outside world with our community. And so this is something where we do a lot of events on our properties where we have individuals that are able to come out. We also have an AmeriCorps program. And so for those of you that aren't aware, AmeriCorps is a uh, federal program that allows us to bring groups of individuals in to do this work. So we're able to train them 
have the careers in conservation and provide a lot of good opportunities. Um, they do mostly habitat restoration, but we also do some conservation education, and we also do disaster response. And so there are times when we're actually called on to help out the community in ways that are other than conservation. And so a good example of that is after the derecho that hit in 2020, uh, we actually went up to Cedar Rapids and we helped that community who was very hard hit by getting rid of a lot of the, the trees that fell onto a lot of the neighborhoods in that area. And so the team spent about 16 days up there doing that big work. Um, in Iowa, the big thing that we do is we try to restore the, the native land to either prairie <coughs> or to what we call the Oak Hickory Savannah. And so Iowa, as a state, was never completely covered by woodlands. It was mostly a prairie state. And I'll show you what that looked like in the pre settlement time in a couple different slides. But what our goal is, is when we go onto a property, is we want to enhance the vegetation. We want to take the things that should be there, all the native species, and provide them with a good place to live. So we go and we do full surveys. We want to know every single species that is on property. And we'll never know every single one. We're never going to know all the insects or all the you know, microbes and things like that. But we can definitely tell some of the larger ones, tree species, turtle species, things like that. We do a lot of management for what's called invasive species. So you probably are aware of this, but there are a lot of species that were brought in from other countries, and they really do wreck our ecosystem. So they come in and they take the place of some of these native species, and unfortunately, uh, that will impact the native species. They aren't able to exist in that area. <coughs> and so we do a lot of invasive species work. It's not the most glamorous work. It's a lot of cutting, uh, treating. There's some things that we do with prescribed players that help us do that. We also do what I would call managing for the most vulnerable species. These are the ones that are the threatened and endangered species that you hear about all the time. Um, Iowa has uh, about 500 uh, threatened or endangered species. I'll show you some of them in a little bit. And we want to make sure that the properties that we have have any of these endangered or threatened species. Those are the species that are most critically at risk and so we want to try to manage for them. And so you have to know that they're there. That's why that survey work is so incredibly important. And one of the best ways that we're able to do this is restoring what we call restoring the fire regime. So back in the pre-settlement days when Iowa was a, a fully prairie, they used to have fires that would really go from the Missouri River all the way to the Mississippi River. Pretty much the entire state would be at risk of burning. And so that really kept a lot of the ecosystems in check. When the settlers came here, uh, the, the European settlers were often afraid of fire. And so they stopped that work. And so they stopped the fires. And so all of that really dramatically changed the landscape in Iowa. And so now we have to bring it back by doing prescribed fire. So a good example of some of the work that we do, here's two oak trees. So these are fairly large, I would say probably 150 to 200 year old oak trees on the property. And when we first acquired this property, it looked a lot like this. These are the same two trees, the same two ankle. You really couldn't even see those trees. They were covered with uh, cedars and honeysuckles and multiple flora rows and all sorts of things. And when oak trees, when the lower limbs of oak trees don't get enough light, they'll die off. And so what we started seeing was that there are a lot of oak trees in Iowa that don't have these long lower limbs anymore because of this particular problem where all this stuff has grown up and around them. And so just a real small example of some of the work that we do, we'll go in there and remove all of that so that oh, those, the light can actually penetrate through and hit those leaves so that you don't lose all those long branches on trees like that. So why is this work important? I mentioned before, there are six different land trusts that are focused on this on Iowa. There's hundreds in, in, in the country, um, and there's many more in the world. So why is this work important? So there's some really interesting reports that came out in the last couple of years. Um, one of them said that, it, in, one in the journal Nature said, plants around the world are going extinct at a rate that is 500 times faster than they should be. So we have whole plants, whole categories of plants that are no longer around, and that's, that's happening incredibly quickly. Another report came out and said that in the next 200 years, so a very, very short time frame, we're at risk of losing about 1 million species. 
So one million species will be going extinct within 200 years unless we make some pretty dramatic changes to the way in which we interact with the ecosystem. And then a third report came out, and I'm sure some of you have noticed this in your lifetime, but it said that in, in, since 1970, so in a very, very short period of time, just North America alone has lost a total of three billion birds. So we simply have fewer birds in North America than we did even in the 70s. So when you start removing individual species from an ecosystem, you don't necessarily know how many you can remove before you start to have what's called an ecological collapse, where things just stop working really well. And so if you lose one bird species, it's probably not going to make a huge difference. If you lose two or three or four, it's probably not going to make a huge difference. But we don't know how many you can lose before you start to have those ecological collapses. Because the entire ecosystem is this giant web, and everything relies on everything else. And, and there's these little niches, these little areas, where things are decomposing stuff, or they're eating certain species, or they're predating other species. We don't know all those interactions. And so unfortunately, when you see a million species, there's going to be some pretty large ecological collapses that are going to be happening in the next 200 years. So why is this happening? There's three reasons it's happening. And it's the same thing in Iowa as it is in every other country in the entire world. And that is habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, and habitat degradation. Those are the reasons that we are losing species uh, across the entire world. And within Iowa, I mentioned it already, but we have 500 species of plants and insects and animals that are currently threatened, endangered, or species of special concern. And so if we don't act now, we have over 500 species that have that are under threat of extinction within this, within this state. And that's, I think that's horrible myself. We have some amazing species in Iowa. Um, there are three different cactus species that are native to this state. So Punta cactus, and this is, this is one of them. And in Johnson County, like if we got in a bus right now, I can take you to a property that's 30 minutes away where there still is a, a native colony of cactus growing on the sand prairie. It's one of the most amazing things. Um, we also have rattlesnakes that are in Iowa. There's two different species of rattlesnakes. There are a lot of different mussel species um, that are in the state. And unfortunately, because of the water quality problems we have, the mussels, almost every single mussel species in the state is either threatened or endangered at this point, simply because they're filter feeders. And so if you put mussels into a body of water and then pollute that water, they can't get out of that. And so they're going to be the first line, they're going to be the first species to, to start to see the problems, this first species that are starting to go. And so we have a big problem right now with mussels. You also will see, I'm sure some of you are aware, but the um, area near Muscatine, they used to make a lot of buttons out of the, the mussel shells, the, the shells from the, the different oysters and things like that over there, the clams. So I've, I've been over to that area before, and there's areas where you can go where they used to dump all those old shells. And so you can kind of pick through them, and there's like perfect holes through them. It's amazing. But those shells, those shells are thick. They're, they're quarter inch, half inch thick clam shells, and they weren't that old. Now, when you find clam shells, they're almost paper thin. You can literally take them and just crush them with your hands like this, because there are various chemicals that are in the water that are keeping them from developing those thick shells. And so not only are they not, the, the, the populations are down, but the, the, the shells themselves are, are very, very thin. And so it makes it so things like raccoons can eat them much more easily. And then one that I personally am very attached to, uh, on the very, on your left over there, that's called the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. I'll talk a little bit more about this later on, but this is a very important species to me. Um, we have them in Iowa. We're one of the only states that has a decent population of them anymore. And uh, I actually have them, they, they come visit my house. They have a prairie at my house. And so the first endangered species that I ever found uh, was, was literally right outside of my, my kitchen door. Uh, I was out, I was drinking coffee on a Sunday morning looking at flowers, and I found my first endangered species. So I'll tell you that story a little bit later. Uh, but all of these species, plus another, you know, 496 are at threat of being lost in the state of Iowa, unless we do something. So this is what Iowa used to look like. 
This is the state of Iowa, and everywhere that it's green was a forested area. And you can tell where the forests were because they were right along all the major rivers. And so if it was a major river, it was a wet environment, and therefore it wouldn't burn that often. And so where it did not burn, you would have forests, you would have trees growing. Now, the rest of the state is all yellow. What's the yellow? Prairie. And so this state had about 95% prairie. We were not a forested state. This state has more trees in it now than it did in 1850. So it's not a problem to have trees, but it's a problem if you have too many trees in areas that used to be prairie, and you're trying to grow prairie there. So that's what it looked like in the 1830 time frame, around when European settlers started coming to the state. This is what it looks like now. So, again, you can see all of the little rivers. You can see a little bit of green around them where some of those forests are. But the vast majority of the state is gray. What do you think that gray is? Corn or soybeans. And so what we did is we took millions of acres of land in 100, about 150 years. We took millions of acres of land that had thousands of species living on it. And we, we scientifically made it so that one of two species existed on that, that land, corn and soybeans. And this is definitely not an anti-farming talk. Like we all know farmers, we all have farmers in our families, uh, we all eat food for, for you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But the problem is that we did this so rapidly, we made Iowa the most altered state in the entire country. Ecologically, we altered our landscape more in Iowa than any other state has in the entire country. So all this yellow that you see, all that yellow is a prairie. All that yellow is pasture land. And so we took 65% of the land of Iowa, put it in corn and soybeans. We took another 15% roughly and put it in pasture land, which is not a substitute for prairie. The only grassland that we have doesn't even show up on this map. You can't even see it. There's so little of it left in the state. And so what we try to do as a land trust, what other land trusts try to do, is we try to find those little gems, the, the areas of Iowa that are still untouched, and we do everything we can. We devote all of our resources to protecting them and to making them better. And the other thing we do is we start to try to claw back what we used to have. And so what we're doing is we're actually doing restoration where it used to be farmland, or it used to be urban land, and now we're trying to put it back into prairie, or put it back into wetlands and woodlands. So a really good example of this is, again, in Johnson County. And some of you probably have driven on this road a lot of times in your life. But this is 12th Avenue in Coralville. And so this first map right here, this is what 12th, this is 12th Avenue in Coralville back in 1875. It existed there. And there's these phenomenal maps called the Andreas Atlas. They're all hand-drawn maps. The original was a big atlas of maps, and it was probably about that tall, this big, huge volume of maps. All hand-drawn to show you exactly where all the woodlands, all the prairies, all, where all the churches, where all the Native American encampments were uh, previously in 1875. This amazing atlas. We use this all the time because it's important for us to understand if we're trying to restore land, we don't want to put the wrong thing there. And so if it used to be woodland, we don't want to try to put prairie there and vice versa. So we look at these maps all the time. 1875, this area here where it looks like little shrubs, that in that map series was called Oak Savannah. So you have prairie, everyone knows what that is, grasses and flowers. You have woodlands, everyone knows what that is, that's trees. Oak Savannah is, is kind of somewhere in between. You have some oak trees, some hickory trees, and then you have a lot of grasses and a lot of uh, forks, a lot of flowers. And just like in where you have the ocean with the intertidal zone, it's very, very rich biodiversity where you have the ocean meeting the land, where you have two different things coming together. It's the same thing with Oak Savannah. You have woodlands meeting prairies. So you have a whole large, you have a very large number of species that live in these areas. And so Oak Savannahs are incredibly important to find and protect at all costs. So we found them. This was, again, in, in Coralville. It's actually, this is Coralville. This is North Liberty up here. Um, and so we're kind of in this area that's, that's still counting between Coralville and North Liberty. We kind of refer to it as the DMZ because both of the communities wanted because of the tax base there. 
And so we were able to acquire what is in the, the red there. It was not in 1990. But you can see some of the stuff that we were talking about. Habitat fragmentation, like I mentioned before, habitat fragmentation just means if you have a nice big prairie and you split it in half, there's problems with that. It doesn't, it doesn't like a 100 acre prairie split in half is not as good as one 100 acre prairie. And so even by putting these roads in, back in 1875, they started to impact the landscape in Iowa. Butterflies can very easily cross a road. The salamander species can't, turtle species can't. There's all sorts of species that can't cross roads very easily or they'll be killed. So by 1990, it was a pretty decent amount of fragmentation as well as habitat loss. This whole area was being farmed by 1990, but there was very little urbanization. There were some roads. There weren't many houses in this area. Fast forward between 1990 and 20, 2016, what you see here is it's all houses. This whole area has been turned into houses. And so this big oak savanna here that was surrounded by prairie is now chunked up. You can still see a little bit of it right here, but most of it is gone. And then this whole area here, instead of being prairie, is now houses, sidewalks, lawn with, with turf grass, things like that. So most of the habitat has been lost from this area, except we do have this nice chunk that we own and we're trying to manage. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit to show you what happened in the last 70 years, roughly. So in 1960, this is just a top-down view. All of these dark areas, these are all trees on this property. And the rest of it is more open grass land. So all the light gray stuff is grass. That was in 1960. This is more of a savanna type atmosphere. 1990, it's starting to fill in. 2010, it's almost 100% covered by trees. Can anyone guess why that would be? <coughs> it wasn't fire. Fire was gone for 100 years by a time of that. In 1990, the landowners took cattle off of this ground. And so cattle, cows were actually replacing fire. They were impacting that land. They were keeping a lot of those trees and shrubs from encroaching on all that prairie. When they removed those cattle, it took that disturbance off. Fire is a good disturbance. Cattle were graders like bison. They were a good disturbance. So what happened was you had trees that covered the entire property. And everyone always thinks, well, trees are a good thing. They think, you know, it's the lungs of the plant, and that absolutely is true. But there were a lot of species that lived in this kind of open grassland with some nice shady trees around it. There were a lot of species that existed in that condition that cannot live in this condition over here. I'll show you some of them. Well, first I'll tell you what we're doing. Um, so what we're planning is we're doing a, a big project to remove a lot of those trees. Everyone's always surprised. They always think that that Borough Land Trust were constantly out planting trees. And I can absolutely tell you that I have cut more trees down in my lifetime than I've planted. And that's because Iowa is a prairie state. And so I've done a lot of tree plantings, and we'll talk about some of the work that we're doing with trees. But we cut trees down where they should not be because there are a lot of species that do not live underneath the, the, the shade of trees. So we're trying to do some canopy reduction. We're getting rid of some of those trees. We're getting fire back into that landscape, which is critically important there. We're trying to get rid of some of those invasive species. So think about all the multiflora rose, the barberry, the honeysuckle, all of those species that are non-native, that crowd out all the native species. And then we're trying to get some of those Spanish species back in there. So this is an area where we've done a lot of chainsaw work, we've done a lot of mowing, but we also did some other interesting things, like we brought in a herd of goats to try to help us with this. And so for about 13 days or so back in 2018, I was a goat herder, and I learned a whole lot about goats during those 13 days. And goats are a very amazing species. Um, we had these electric fences around them, but what we found is that the goats could very easily get over the electric fences. And so the whole goal was really just to keep the goats happy inside the fence so that they didn't want to come out. And so it was, it was interesting. I'm not a huge fan of working with goats, but I did learn a lot. So some of the species that were on this property that, again, existed in that big open space that was over here, but not so much in the closed-in space, some of those were orchid species. So Iowa has 36 different species of orchids 
that grow natively in the state. Most people think of orchids and they think of you know, the, the tropical rainforest and things like that. We have 36 species, including the one that's on that property, which is called the lesser lady tresses. It's a beautiful plant. It's about, they grow about you know, eight to 10 inches tall. And they just have this amazing uh, array of flowers that grow up, and there's nothing else you've ever seen. And so for the first, we started doing all this work out there. We had goats grazing, we removed trees, and so for the first time ever, we saw these lady trusses pop up. And they just started coming back, and no one seeded it, but they had seed that was, that was still in the soil from when they still existed out there during that old conditions. But these are, other, these are four other species of orchids that exist in Johnson County. So these aren't just in other counties in Iowa. There are areas that we have where all of these, these species, amazing species, exist. And so some of them are incredibly complex. There's one that only, the leaves only come up during the winter. And then, so you, you go out and you see these green leaves on the ground during the winter when nothing else is green. And it's this orchid species. Come spring, the leaf dies, and for about three days, they'll put up a stalk of flowers, and then it goes away. And then there's nothing else for the rest of the year. So there's amazing species like that that are existing in, in the state of Iowa. A lot of people know of the, the lady slippers, the white and the yellow. This is called toy blade, and this one up here is uh, spectacular. Another species on that property that I was showing you that really liked it in the kind of more open area is the ornate fox turtle. And this is one of those species that I just absolutely love. Um, the first one I ever saw in the wild was on this property. And there's just something very, very special about finding uh, an ornate fox turtle um, in an area that's native. So this species, uh, they will live about 40 to 50 years in the wild. And so they, they do, are one of those species that have a very long life cycle. They don't start producing young until they're about 13 years old. And so unfortunately what's happening is because of the increased number of raccoons, because of the increased uh, poaching from people, the ornate box turtle, uh, the numbers, the population numbers, have plummeted within this state. And so they really like sandy soil. They really like areas that have both shade as well as sun. If they get cold during the day, they go into the sun. If they get too hot, they'll either burrow in the ground or they'll go in the shade. So that works really well if you have an area like this. If they're cold, they go in the sun. If they're hot, they go in the shade. It works fantastically well for this. Over here, if they get cold, there's no sun to get to. There's very little sun that penetrates through where they can actually warm up during the day. And so when these species are 40 years old, they existed, they were born into an environment that had that nice sun, but now they, they don't. And so that's a huge problem. They don't mate unless they can, they can bask in the sun. And some people think, well, well, they can just like go to another area. The problem is there's no area for them to go to. This is where they were born. This property, the red area, is about 40 acres. Those turtles, the habitat, the range of those turtles throughout their entire life is about three acres. So they will, they will be hatched out of a shell and live their entire 40-year life in about a three-acre span, three-acre area. And so they can't go south because it's all lawn. They can't go north because there's a creek there. They can't, they can't swim. It's a, they're terrestrial turtles only. And they can't go west because west is more of the same. It's all trees. And so unfortunately what we have is we have a population of turtles that is a ghost population. They're never going to mate because they don't have enough sun. And so what we're doing is if I have a map from 2021, we don't have that, You'll see we've cleared out massive tracts of this, this woodland because a lot of these trees, were, they should not have been there. And we want to give the turtles a place where they can actually bask and mate so we get more populations of turtles in that area. We did some additional work in Johnson County, um, the Hawkeye Wildlife Area. If some of you have heard that, it's owned by the federal government. It's part of the Army Corps of Engineers land. When they put the dam in Coralville in 1953, they had to purchase massive tracts of land so that if they needed to you know, have the dam uh, raised so they could flood things, then they would have this area where they could flood it. And so Hawkeye Wildlife Area is hundreds and hundreds of acres 
up near North Liberty. And they have up there the one of the best horny uh, box turtle breeding grounds in the Midwest. It's amazing. There's over a thousand specimens up there. And so we went and we worked with a team that actually was, was trying to identify the, the population, how big the population was, what the breeding numbers were, and things like that. But finding these turtles can be pretty difficult. Um, this is a baby turtle, so that's a real small one. The big ones only get to be you know, about this big, so they're not very big. When you have them in grass, they're very difficult to find. And so there's a guy, John Rucker, who actually lives in Montana. He has raised a team of dogs, or he has trained a team of dogs, boys and spaniels, to scent turtles. And so we, with a grape from the DNR, we brought John out. And we had his team of dogs help us find these turtles. And once we found them, there's a way that you can actually um, catalog the turtles. All the tur all the bottom of the turtles, it's like a fingerprint. It's a unique pattern. And so you can tell one turtle from the next just based on the bottom of it. So we took photographs of all their shells. We made notches in them so we could put the numbering system down. All this work was done um, in 2018 as well as in 2020. Um, it was a pretty amazing thing. These, these dogs were fantastic. Uh, it was just like they were scenting on birds. They would go out, and when they found a turtle, they would pick it up in their mouth. They were extraordinarily gentle, and then they would bring it back to you. And then we would do all this work in the field to get their weight and their, to determine what sex they were, all of that. And then we would return that turtle to the area that we found it. Um, what we're finding is that it's a healthy population out there. But unfortunately, the biggest problem, there's two big problems in that area. One, as soon as a, a female turtle lays its eggs, uh, raccoons will go dig them up and eat them. And so that's the biggest problem. The second biggest problem is people. These are small enough where people like to keep them as pets. And so there is a black market trade for horny box turtles in, in the, the country. And so people will go out and find them and take them and sell them. And it's, it's highly illegal since these are threatened species, but unfortunately it happens. And so we're trying to figure out ways that we can combat this, but it's very difficult. It's very easy for people to go out there with a backpack, stuff full of turtles, and take off before someone knows it. And so it's, we're working on it, but unfortunately it's, it's something that's going to be difficult. This was an amazing, uh, one of the amazing specimens that we found. There's ways that you can tell males and females from each other pretty simply in the field. Um, the males, because of the way they mate, they, they do selection from the males having coloration like a lot of birds. And so the males will have these bright green faces, and then they'll also have these really bright red eyes. And so this was a male. We found this one, he was about 35 to, 30, uh, 35 to 40 years old. Just an amazing turtle. Just really feisty, they're very feisty turtles. And so we were finding quite a few of these, they were amazing. The youngest one that we found was about two years old. And they're very tiny. When they're born, they're about the size of a quarter. And then they grow up to that size over the, the course of 40 years. They're an amazing species, so we really do like working with them. Um, the other species that I work with a lot is the rusty patch bumblebee. So as I mentioned, uh, in 2018, I had just started working with the Burrow Plant Trust, um, was drinking some coffee. I went outside on a Sunday morning, was just looking at what flowers were blooming in my yard. And I, I saw this bee. And I, I knew that one of the bees had been put on the endangered species list called the rusty patch bumblebee. And I was able to get a picture of this bee. This is the actual photo I took that day. And I submitted it to this site called bumblebeewatch.org. And they verified that it was a, a rusty patch bumblebee. So this really set me off. The fact that I had an endangered species in my yard was just amazing to me. And so we trained a group of volunteers at Burroughs. Um, and we went out to all of our properties because I was thinking, if I have them in my tiny little prairie, which is literally the size, like the length of this room, and not even you know, half the half the size of this, um, if we had them in that size of the prairie, they probably were on some of the borough properties. And so we trained a bunch of volunteers. We went out to the borough properties, and we found that they were on five of the properties that we owned and managed. And so that just really lit my fire. Like we were super excited about this. So. We started working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to do some additional um, management of the lands that we own. Turkey Creek Preserve was one of the big ones that many people might know. Um, that one had a great population of rusty patch bumblebees, and so we did a lot of work there for that particular species. Um, unfortunately, they have declined an incredible amount. 
that number at this point, 87% population decline, that's up to 90% right now. And so this is a species that is rapidly going downhill, even, even after it was put on the endangered species list. And so it's only found in just this tiny, tiny little fraction of the area that it used to be in. So one interesting thing that happened from this is we started doing some work with it, and uh, the NRDC, a phen phenomenal organization to work with, um, they actually fought back against some of the things that were happening at the federal level. And so what happened was the federal government protected the species, but they did not protect its habitat. All they did was they protected the individual bees, but they didn't protect the bees' habitat. Well, if the bees don't have places to live, then they're not going to exist. And so it's not like the gray wolf, or it's not like the bald eagle. You can, you can outlaw hunting of wolves, you can outlaw hunting of eagles, but no one's hunting rusty pet bumblebees. And so you really have to protect the habitat. So the US government did not protect the habitat, and so the NRDC sued them. They said it's incredibly important for us to sue, to actually have uh, protection on the habitat as well as the species itself. And interestingly, through the work that we've been doing, um, they contacted me and they asked if I personally, not, not for oath, but if I personally as a citizen uh, would be interested in being a part of the lawsuit. And so currently there's two uh, declarants in the case and I'm one of them. And so we're really fighting hard to try to get the, the government to actually protect the habitat of this species, not just the bee alone. So we're still, we're pushing forward with this. One of the important things that we can do is we can find out where they are. And so we're training volunteers every single year to go out, and not only on their properties, but to go out to other areas and try to find them. Because it's important for us to know where they are so that we know when the protection happens, we know what areas to protect. So this is a massive, massive project that we've been working on. Another one that has been very interesting to me um, is the connection between a native tree species called the pawpaw and a native butterfly species called the zebra swallowtail butterfly. So I mentioned that there are a lot of species that are, are endangered or threatened in the state of Iowa. This tree is a, uh, a species of special concern. Its numbers are declining. And this butterfly is a threatened species. And the reason that both of them are, are going away is because they are, they're so interlinked. So over here, you can see this right here is the range map. It shows you where the zebra swallowtail butterfly lives in the United States. And this shows you where the pawpaw tree lives in the United States. And they overlap pretty tightly. And the reason for that is the zebra swallowtail caterpillar only eats one thing, pawpaw leaves. So if you get rid of pawpaws, you get rid of the zebra swallowtail butterfly. Now, I'm sure some of you grew up in Iowa and lived here your whole life. Have any of you ever seen a pawpaw tree in Iowa? You have. That's excellent. Not like very few people have ever seen one in Iowa. That's good though. And so the problem that we were seeing is that they pretty much are not existent on the landscape anymore. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to reintroduce the pawpaw tree and put it on not only the borough properties, they actually put it into the urban environment, get it into people's yards. And the whole reason for this is not for the pawpaw fruit, which is an amazing thing, but it's so that it gives the zebra swallowtail caterpillar something to eat, and so therefore we're going to have a, 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 a better population of this one particular butterfly. Now, the pawpaw fruit itself is amazing. If you've never had it, you've never seen it. They grow large. They can be as large as a, a big potato, and when you cut them, it's like a, a, a yellowish, kind of a creamy fruit on the inside. It tastes like a combination of a banana and a mango. And so it is actually a tropical fruit that grows and is native to the state of Iowa. It's the largest native fruit in North America, and hardly anyone knows about it. And so I've actually been working with um, a former professor of mine at the university, his name is Lon Drake. Lon got in the pawpaws about 15 years ago. And so now what we're doing is we're going through and we are taking the seeds out of the pawpaws, we're planting the seeds in pots, and then we're working with people in the community to grow these over the, over the summer, and then bringing them back to us, and we're going to be planting them on our properties and selling some of them. And so this year we had about 800. 
uh, we were able to get about 800 seeds, and then we were able to get about 500 trees to grow from those 800 seeds. With my AmeriCorps team, I actually was able to get about 4,000 seeds this year. We went through about 200 pounds of pawpaw fruit, rotten, smelling pawpaw fruit. We were able to pick through that, clean up the seeds, and we got about 4,000 of them. And so we're not going to plant all 4,000. We're going to try to sell them and things like that to you know, try to distribute a little larger. But the whole goal of this is simply to get this butterfly back in this community. And so that's the stuff that we do. That's the commitment of the, the work that we have. A lot of people would say it's just another butterfly. But it's, it's a missing piece of a puzzle that is incredibly important. We don't know the connection this butterfly has to our ecosystem, but we know that it's missing. And so if we can do something to bring it back, it's going to make the ecosystem healthier. That's what we're trying to do. The cool cap to this story is, this was my backyard three years ago. It was about 100 pawpaws. This year I had about 150. We actually worked and we had uh, members of the community uh, come and adopt to create the pawpaws. And then they would grow them at their own house and brought them back to us. I had about 150 in my house this year. For the first time ever, I had a zebra swallowtail visit my yard in Iowa City. And so we know it's working. We know that this butterfly species is out there. There's other places in Iowa City where they've seen them before. A friend of mine sent me a photo. I have this one, when you're in the conservation world, people will send you photos of stuff all the time. They'll be, what, what type of snake is this? What type of butterfly is this? Usually it's not very exciting. A friend of mine sent me a picture and they're like, hey, this butterfly is on my zinnias in my garden. Do you know what it is? I was like, oh my God, is it still there? And so it was a zebra swallowtail butterfly. We submitted it. It was the first recorded zebra swallowtail ever found in Iowa City. And so the work we're doing is slow. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort and resources, but it's slowly we're kind of grabbing back what we've lost in the past. So I want to say thank you for your support. Um, the Oakville community is actually one of the largest like, communities that we have of supporters for Borough Planning Trust. I was looking at the information today because we were going to try to reach out to some people that are supporters of Borough Planning Trust that you know, make sure that they were able to come here. And we found that there's a large number of local supporters, and so we do appreciate that. Um, there's all sorts of ways that, that the work that you guys are, are doing for us, providing us with support, allows us to do all of this stuff and way more. Um, we have a full team. We have four staff members, and we have 10 full-time AmeriCorps members that every single day are, are honestly just working their butts off to try to get this stuff to happen. All the restoration work, all the land protection work, um, currently, we are working on one of the most amazing property acquisitions that I've ever taken part in. And this is a property that's in Muscatine County, and it is going to be a massive project. It's 200 acres, it's sand, prairie, and it's wetlands. And it has a Punta cactus growing on it. And we've already found a beetle on it, it's only been found in one other place in Iowa. We think there's two endangered species of turtles on it. And so we are working just passionately to try to get this piece of land and the only reason that we're able to do it is through the support of the community. So I absolutely do appreciate everything that everyone has done for us. So with that, I do want to say again, thank you. And if anyone has any questions, um, I can definitely take them. Um, and I also do have, for those of you that have not seen it, uh, we do have a magazine we put out a couple times a year. The next one is going to be going out in about another three weeks or so. But if anyone is interested, I do have some of the, uh, the last copies up there. So, any questions? Uh, so we walked a lot to Kathy Dickens. Yes. So you want to talk a little about that? It's nice. Yeah, so Kathy Dickens, if those of you that don't know, it's actually very close to here. It was actually, it's, it's connected to uh, Hickory Hill Park. And so that, that area is very interesting. Hickory Hill Park is a phenomenal property that the city owns and manages. Kathy Dickens was donated to Borough Plan Trust. And it's one of those properties where it could have very easily been turned into houses. Um, but we were able to protect it, make sure there's a small prairie there. Actually, that's one of the areas that we did find the rusty patch bumblebee. And so just in a fairly small prairie, we were able to find this endangered species. Um, some of you know that the land, um, so that's on the very western side of Hickory Hill Park. This property just south of us is on the very eastern side. And I'm sure many of you are aware that that whole area was slated for development. So that whole piece of land that was south of here was slated for development. And they fought against it. 
And they went to the city and they made sure that people, you know, understood that they were going to be losing a lot of really valuable habitat over there if that was turned into houses. And so it, it got pushed back and pushed back. And actually, the developer called me and he said, "What would you do? With it? What would you do with that land if we were able to just like protect the whole thing? What would you do?" And so I kind of laid out some stuff, and we actually worked out so that they were able to put the um, their retirement center at the very southern end of it. But they're now going to be protecting 35 acres and donating it to the city. And so that whole area to the south is not going to be houses. It's going to still be protected land. It's going to be restored. So yeah, thank you. And so that's the awesome stuff that like I get so passionate about. And we do anything we can to try to protect it. Now, that being said, we all live in houses. We all drive on the roads. We all do all these things. It's just you have to be sustainable. You have to be smart about it. You don't want to put things where you have endangered species, threatened species, things like that. Yeah, Happy Davis is a phenomenal property. Turkey Creek, uh, our big road property out near where the county has the, the big brown barns. Um, we have some really interesting properties. Uh, Happy Dickens has a very rusty station wagon. It does. Is that that that's going to be part of just deteriorating that, here? That's a, a cultural artifact. Um, <laughs> uh, about 15 years ago, I was not here then. About 15 years ago, they actually made plans to remove that. There, the car was the nice piece of garbage there, I'll put that way. There were washing machines. There was all the stuff that you find a lot of times kind of just dumped in Iowa. And so they got rid of all of that. And then they said, well, while we're doing this, we can easily cut up the car and we get rid of it. And people just did not want that. And so it's one of those things where it's just, it's allowed to sit there. Uh, it's not native, but it's also not burdening. And so, you know, there's no oil or anything like that leaking out of it. And so, but we do, uh, my wife and I do a lot of hiking out in like the Joshua Tree area in California. And they have a rule, if it's 50 years old or older, it's considered to be a cultural artifact. <laughs> and so, I always refer to that car as a cultural artifact. <laughs> but we do have uh, another one of our properties. Um, we actually have some Native American mounds, and so there's some other things like that where they are true cultural artifacts, really, really important pieces of our cultural history. Yes? I would imagine that children could really become engaged with this kind of thing. Do you go into the schools and talk to kids? We do, a little bit. We used to more, obviously, pre-COVID, things like that. But the big thing is, I, I think going into schools and talking about it is incredibly important. Um, I think having the kids come out to our properties and really engage with it is way more effective. And so we work with a lot of schools. We work with the University of Iowa School of the Wild to have them come out to our properties. There's a nature-based school in Iowa City now called Camerack. And those kids, it's, it's a full-blown school. Those kids are on out in nature 50% of the day. So for half of the day, they're out in nature learning about things. The other half of the day, they're inside. And it doesn't matter if it's hot, or if it's cold, if it's snowing, or if it's raining. They're outside and they're learning so much. And so we work with them, a lot of those programs, Taproot is another one. They're on our pro uh, properties constantly. And if I ever have questions about our properties, th these kids from Taproot, I mean, some of them are tiny. They, know, they just know everything about it. Um, they found some amazing stuff. On one of our properties, the, a little girl, she, she was nine years old. She was just, you know, creek something, going through the creeks. Some of our properties have amazing fossils. Because obviously this whole area, it's called Coral Hill for a reason, this whole area used to be, you know, part of an ocean, a sea. And so there's all these amazing corals and, and fossils and things like that on some of our properties. They found, this little nine-year-old girl found a complete mastodon tooth, a mammoth tooth, completely intact. And I was just amazed that some of the stuff that we found in some of them. There was another one um, that found some Native American artifacts out there. And so they just, yeah, the, the kids on the properties are just absolutely amazing. You see, you see them experience some of this stuff for the first time ever, and it just reminds you how incredibly important it is. Any other questions? Thank you. Are, are any of your properties available for hiking and so on? Yeah, so you have the option. All that, again, it's, it's so important for the public to get out onto our lands, and so we make every single one of our properties open to the public. We don't have time limits on them. We don't charge people to go onto them. But we have trails that are available. Um, we have, like, we, we, I'll take people out on guided tours all the time. 
Because again, we're trying to get, in, get people to engage with those properties from nature. And so yeah, Turkey Creek Preserve is one property that I would say is a really good, it has a good parking lot, there's nice level trails, there's some phenomenal flowers there. Um, in the spring, the wildflowers are just amazing. And so yeah, we, we really pride ourselves on the fact that all of our properties are open to the public. Additional questions? All right. Well, I'll be up here if anyone has any questions or wants to talk, uh, definitely let me know. But again, if you have, if anyone ever wants to go out onto our properties and get a guided tour, I love to do that. It gets me out of the office, which I feel like I'm in way too often. Um, but I, I do love to, to get out the properties and show people some amazing things. So please definitely contact me. All right, thank you.